We've got a lot of ground to cover, so get ready, get phones ready to take pictures, get notes ready for what we have to do. I was reading the story of a ship captain who had a regular route from California to Columbia. And one day shortly before leaving for California, as he dropped his load off in Columbia from the U.S., one day before he was leaving, the Columbia cartel sent him a message and offered him $500,000 to carry a small shipment of narcotics, of illegal drugs, to the U.S. And he quickly said no. He had no, no reason that he wanted to be part of that. He said it happened on his next three trips, and every trip they kept raising the offer if he, would, if he would take these illegal drugs back to the United States. And finally, they reached $2 million. If they can just put it in, and he, all he has to do is just go do his business, and there will be people there to unload the illegal drugs. When they offered him $2 million, he, he said he hesitated and finally said maybe. He then contacted the DEA here in the, in, in the United States, and a sting operation was set up. Drug dealers were arrested. But here's what was interesting. One of the DEA, DEA agents asked the captain, why did you wait until it got to $2 million before contacting us? And here's what he said. They were getting too close to my price. <laughs> Temptation knows your price. Temptation knows where you are defenseless and susceptible and will relentlessly keep making offers to your soul. That's what temptation does. It keeps knocking, making the offers, upping the ante. There is a promise about these relentless offers that gives me hope in the book of Isaiah. Here's what it says, Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon that is formed against you, hallelujah, will prosper. Folks, I don't know about you, but that's good news today. But it's very interesting to me that the word formed is a very personal word. The word form, when it says no weapon formed against you, that word actually means tailor-made, custom-built. It's a word for someone that was used for ordering pottery and wants it made to order. And what Isaiah is doing is giving us a sobering warning that every battle you face and I face, get this now, is custom-built for us and where you're at in your heart and soul, which means they are demonically engineered weapons made specifically to harm you and go after your weakest areas. These aren't, these aren't random things coming against you, folks. Where, wherever you're watching from, whether it's from a balcony or you're watching from Italy, these Things are, these, these temptations are demonically engineered. For some, it's intellect. You get so buried in intellect, you lose faith. For some, it's fear, fear of health, fear of dying. For others, it's loneliness and even a fear of being lonely. It's for others, it's greed and this desire to be rich because all you've, your family is known is to be in poverty. For others, it's lust and it's, it's the chains of pornography. And here's the bad news. Satan goes after your most vulnerable spot. That's the bad news. That's the, the tailor making. But here's the good news. No weapon formed against you has to prosper. Let's make sure today that we figure out and know what the Bible says about winning what we would call spiritual warfare. See, temptation is fighting the tailor-made offers and attractions. Let me say that again. Tailor, spiritual warfare, and, and, and as we're dealing with this, is temptation, get this now, is fighting those tailor-made offers and attractions. Now, I want to say something to you. That, that I had to just kind of keep digesting. Get this now, you're gonna see it. In order for temptation to be temptation, it has to attract me. It has to have something I want. Now, for some of you are going like, well, of course, that's it. But folks, this is what makes it, makes it even more difficult to understand. Jesus' three temptations would not be temptations if there wasn't something there that the enemy wasn't going after. 
He was trying to lure Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. And that's hard to say because I'm just going, Jesus would be invincible. But because Jesus was tempted in, in, in all points as we are, listen to it. Hebrews 4.15, we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. But here's the good news, yet he did not sin. See, it's the old Puritan writer said it like this. The devil had an apple for Eve, a grape for Noah, a change of raiment for Gehazi, silver for Judas. We can keep adding to that. He had raiment and gold bars for Achan. He can dish out his meal to all pallets. That's the tailor-made part of that. He knows what is going to be the thing that will begin to hit those vulnerable and susceptible areas. But the good news is not that you, they don't have to prosper, but the good news gets a little bit better. Get ready, this is good news. The same presence and power of the Holy Spirit who enabled Jesus to resist, hallelujah, resides in every Christian. I, 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 listen, keep that on the screen for a moment because I... I know what it's like. You always say that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me. I love that verse. But sometimes I have to remember that the same spirit who enabled Christ to overcome and resist temptation, that Holy Spirit resides in you if you're a born-again Christian. The story of Robert, who is one of our deacons in Detroit many years ago, is a story that is always, when I think of this word temptation, always begins to fill my mind. Graduate of a Teen Challenge and an amazing man. He was a hard worker and served as one of our key leaders in our church. And then one day, Robert didn't show up. He wasn't there anymore. It was so puzzling it, because, because it, it, he, didn't, it, he didn't just gradually fall off. It was gone. It was just didn't come. He didn't show up to church after faithfully being there for years, I think almost a decade. When I talked with his wife, this is what she told me. She said, Robert went back into the crack house in the neighborhood. Just, just it, it looked from an outside that it just happened. Like you're going, you're, you're in leadership, and then one day you're at a crack house. I, I literally gathered together three of our biggest Christians in the church to go get Robert out of a crack house. I knocked on the door. I remember, and I put them right in front of me that if there was going to be shooting, they would get it first. And I put them all right in front of me. I knocked, stepped away, and I said, you guys got this. And so I just, as the, as the it, literally, it was a sliding, it was, like, it was like a prohibition thing from the 20s. The thing slided, what do you want? I said, I am Robert's pastor, send him out now. And, the, and, and I remember that door the, the slide shutting, the door opening, and then pushing him out. And through days and weeks of talking to him, I'll never forget his words. And this is what he said to me. He said, Pastor Tim, every day I would leave my house and go to work to provide for my family. He said, I would come to this main street in Detroit to catch the bus. He said, but every day I had a choice to turn right to the bus stop or to turn left to go back to the old neighborhood. He said, every day I stepped up, there was these two choices that were fake, right or left. If I turned left, it would take me to the crack house. And if I turned right, it would take me to the bus stop. I'd get to the work, my job and then support my family. And then he said this, he said, I don't know what happened, but after 10 years, I chose left. I just chose left. Those words stuck with me, church. Robert chose left. That's the strength of temptation. Puritan writer Thomas Brooks, listen to this. He said it like this. He said, if God were not my friend, then Satan would not be my enemy. That the day Robert made God his friend, Robert was on the enemy list of hell. And folks, I can't say it any other way. The day you become a Christian, you are an enemy of hell. Temptation begins to come your way. In 1 Peter 5.8, Satan is given a description that makes me shudder. 
He is called a roaring lion who is looking for a meal. Listen to it. Be of sober spirit and be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Seeking someone to devour means Satan is not only on a mission, but he's on a mission to destroy. And here's what I have determined. Here it comes now, church. This is what I have determined going forward. I don't want to be the devil's next meal. I've just decided that. I'm not going to be, how many are with me on that? Saying I'm not going to be the next meal for this roaring lion. Now, I've learned some interesting things about lions. I was just looking at this verse that I think we almost could see some of the enemy's tactics. I want you to jot these down. What, and then I'm going to give you some real tools. What makes a lion's hunt successful? This is, this was, it's so intriguing and so applicable to me. This is the first thing it said. It said, a lion must first stalk undetected before it attacks. Surprise your prey is how the lion feasts. Because they are too slow to catch an animal alert to its presence. The prey of lions know that a visible lion is a safe lion. They're not afraid if they can see the lion. Because a herd of gazelle will allow a lion to walk some hundred feet away because it sees it. It's too slow to catch it. But you will never see temptation and the devil coming. It lurks and then it pounces. And that's why we have to stay sober and awake and always in battle formation. Because the enemy is always prowling. Number two, jot this down. Lions catch whatever's easiest. They often kill the young, the sick. The old, some of you are going like, that's everybody in the church. Okay, just stay with the young, the sick, the old. And then this was the other one they put on. The young, the sick, the old, and the careless. The careless. The young, the sick, the old, and the careless. Now this one, okay, strap in for this one. They said one of the other things that makes it a successful hunt is that when the fire goes out, the lion moves in. They said in the evening... When the fire goes out, the lions move in. It's important that when whoever, the traveler, whether it is, whether it is tourists or whether it is hunters, the fire has to be on all night long. It says when the jungles, um, I was reading the story of Kenya, in Kenya, a doctor and his wife, after flying from America, a day of bird watching and photography, they went to bed in, in Kenya with a, campfire outside and they've been warned to keep logs on the fire so the lions would be kept away and the fire was blazing hot and then they fell asleep and when they woke up there was only smoldering embers but the problem was only one woke up woke up because the the smoldering em embers literally invited the darkness invited the lion into the tent which began to take the life of the doctor's wife when you lose your fire, you become a candidate for the devil's next meal. Folks, let me put it to you this way. The first warning that the fire is waning is when you are lukewarm. Now, let me, let, some of you are going like, I've heard about that in Revelation 3. Let me explain to you what lukewarm is. Best definition. Here it is. Lukewarm means this. I still believe in God. I'm just not that excited about him anymore. Folks, look at me. Look at me for a second. You know how you know the fire's waning? Is if you can sit here when people are calling out and you're sitting here with your hands in your pocket or by your side and people are calling. Folks, let me just tell you something. When we start calling on God, I'm the most desperate man in this place because I know that lion lurks. If you want to sit there and look sophisticated, then God, 
I was going to not bless you, God help you. Because outside these doors, those lions are lurking and looking for some. Folks, I'm telling you, the greatest way you can keep a fire going is lift those hands, lift those voice, ask God just to come. And listen, some of you are sitting here and your, and your religion keeps you so sophisticated. But when you know lions are out there, I don't need sophisticated. I'll be the first one to go, hell, I need God's help in my life. Some of you look, some of you are so pious during the worship. Like this is maturity. Let me watch these desperate people. Look at me, look at me. I am desperate. You don't win battles like this. You win battles going, come Jesus. The great missionary martyr, Jim Elliott, said this. Listen to his prayer. He said, he makes his ministers a flame of fire. And then says, am I ignitable? God deliver me from the dread asbestos of other things. Saturate me with the oil of thy spirit that I may be a flame. Flame is transient, short-lived. Canst thou bear this, my soul, short life? And then he cries, make me thy fuel, flame of God. Make me thy fuel. That's my prayer. Make me thy fuel. Anything that is, has asbestos to it, I don't want it. If what I see, watch, see, even who I hang out. Folks, there are some asbestos people that's got to get out of your lives. Because they're not drawing you to God. They're beginning to insulate you from God. I got to do another one. Okay, here we go. Fourth one. Okay, this one. Let me do this quick. Where stragglers roam... Lions feed. Lions know their strength, and they also know the strength of numbers. When a lion is looking at a a herd, he knows if he attacks one, then he is going to be a victim of a stampede and to be trampled. And this is what it said. Lions look for the rebellious one that doesn't want to hang with the herd, that isolates itself all by itself. When that zebra gets far enough from the pack, the lion pounces. It pulls it into the tall grass, goes for the juggler before the herd even knows what's happening. Stay in fellowship. Listen to me. Stay in fellowship. Don't be a straggler that doesn't think you need the family of God. This is your herd. This is your herd. This is the one that you're next to. You need them. Because when, sometimes when we don't see the pounce, the lurking there, we need each other. I don't want to be the devil's next meal. I don't want to be that. The devil prowls looking for those operating by themselves. The stragglers who have distanced themselves from the people of God. He's looking for those who have let the fire go out. The devil is out to devour the easiest, the young, the old, the sick, and the careless. And the devil will lie in wait and pounce. There has to be a fight in us. There has to be weapons against this. We are in a battle. But with God, this battle can be won. The great Scottish preacher Robert Murray McShane said this. He says, I know well that when Christ is nearest, Satan is also the busiest. So here's what you have to know. When, when we're led by Ricardo and Vicky and even by Kareem in times of worship, as you're feeling his presence, get ready. That's when Satan gets busy. As you're starting to, how many have ever started to worship and you're wanting to, everything in you, check your phone, see who's tech. And, and you just want to go like, I don't even care about them. Why am I even going to pick up my phone? Leave that thing down. Lift your hands and say, I am not going to be distracted for what God wants to do. Thank God he is close to us. But the scariest thing is that the whisper of temptation sometimes can be heard much easier than the loudest call to duty. And I'm gonna give you a call to duty today. And this verse is so powerful in the fight over temptation. 
It's probably the, 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 the verse I've leaned upon in so many different ways. Here's what it says. Paul says it like this. Here's your call to duty. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful. Folks, here comes the good news. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation. This is good news. Will provide the way of escape so that you will be able to endure. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here is what we're being told. Get this now. You can never be delivered from being tempted, but you can experience victory from giving in to temptation. Folks, listen, you are going to be tempted until you get to heaven. Let, let's just be honest. So, the, the, when you get saved, folks, the sensitivity goes up in us spiritually. But that temptation is always going to come. See, here's the good news. It, 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 second part's good news. Christ was tempted, so we will be tempted. Christ overcame, so we can overcome. That's the good news about this. Uh, let me just for a moment, just to kind of get us thinking this way, just put it in a little bit of, of today's language. Listen to it in Ken Taylor's version, the, the paraphrase, the living Bible. Ken says it like this. He says, but remember this. The wrong desires that come into your life aren't anything new and different. We all get them. Many others have faced exactly the same problems before, and no temptation, hallelujah, is irresistible. And then he says this, you can trust God to keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it. For he has promised this and will do what he says. He will show you how to escape temptation's power so that you can bear up patiently against it. Hallelujah. That's good news to me. Listen, Richard Sieb says that Satan gives Adam an apple and takes away paradise. And then he says this, therefore, in all temptations, let us consider not simply what it offers, but what we lose in it. 20 years, I pastored a church in a pornographic theater that we, we changed a triple X theater into a church. Our offices, it was, and right next to us was a, was a, um, a, a prostitution hotel. It was, we bought, the, we bought the flagship pornography theater, turned it into a church. Right next to us was the, um, was the hotel where they would post the hourly rates for prostitution and the, for the rooms. And then we had our offices for 10 years um, in the parking lot of an adult bookstore. We were right above it. And it was, it was right, right there. We, we, God opened it up that we had a soup kitchen there and our offices. And every day, I pulled my car into, into the parking lot and there was a yellow set of stairs. At the bottom of the stairs, there was an entryway into the pornographic bookstore and the yellow stairs would lead us up to our church offices. So if you were coming in for counseling, you had, <laughs> this is gonna see if you're a victorious Christian or not. I'm just telling you right now. Because every time you pulled in, you had to walk up. You, it, was, it was like Robert, you had a choice of where to go. And folks, but let me just tell you something. Every day, I had a choice to go up the steps or to go forward. Every day. I had a but what, what happened was, was this, was I kept thinking, not what it offered, but what could be lost. Not, what, not what's given in it. See, that's sometimes what we don't do, is we forget it's not what is offered, but what we lose. And that's why when I would pull in there, I would strap on my armor for 10 years. And I'd put it on and going, listen, I may be clanking going up the stairs with a shield of faith and feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and a sword of the spirit and a helmet of salvation. And I may be slow up those stairs, but here by God's grace, I'm getting up those stairs. I'm going to get up those stairs. 
The great 19th century preacher Spurgeon said it like this. He said, if you tell me when God permits a Christian to put aside his armor, I'll tell you when Satan has left off temptation. But he said, but we're like the old knights in wartime. We keep, we sleep with helmet and breastplate buckled on for the arch deceiver. We'll seize our first unguarded hour to make us as prey. The Lord keep us watchful in all seasons and give us in a final escape from the jaw of the lion and the paw of the bear. Hallelujah. Temptation is strong for all of us. Those that are watching online, listen, Hong Kong. Listen, Taiwan. Listen, listen carefully. Sweden, Denmark. Temptation is strong. Let, let me explain it to you like this. What is temptation? Get this down. Let me just go through this fast, and then I'm going to give you some tools. What is temptation? Keep this in mind. Temptation is not sin. This is, this is the allurement. This is the offer price. This is, the, um, this is the, 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 the captain always getting the offer. Deliver the drugs. Deliver the drugs. Temptation is not the sin. Temptation is a fork in the road. It's the presentation of a choice of which road you're going to take. Do you, do you smuggle the drugs in? Do you, do, you, do, you, do you turn right or left at the main street? Bus, bus stop or crack house? Do you go up the yellow metal stairs or do you go into the, to the, to the adult bookstore? It's, it, temptation is always a fork in the road. And what it does, get this, this is important, temptation feeds on curiosity. It tells me what I don't have and what I can get if I just take the next step, if I say yes. See, here's Here's what I want you to see. Tempta the word temptation simply means test. What is it? It's a test to prove to God that you love him supremely. That you love him above all else. That when it comes in, and I'm going to explain to you how that actually happens and how that takes place. Because temptation gets its power by persuading me to believe that I will be more happy if I follow it. That's the, that's the persuasion of temptation. So now listen to your battle orders one more time, and then let me give you tools. Here are your battle orders. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above which you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. But with the temptation, listen to the words again, but with the temptation, the knock on the door, the offer to deliver the narcotics, the, the right or left, do I go up the yellow stairs or into the adult bookstore? With the temptation that you're facing in the Bronx or the temptation that you're facing in Amsterdam, the temptation that you're facing on Staten Island or the temptation that you're facing in Rio de Janeiro. Listen to me. With that temptation that you are battling with right now, those that live in Rome and that are watching with us, those that are watching from Saudi Arabia, those in Cairo that are listening, with the temptation that you're facing, God says this, I'm faithful that I'll provide a way out of this thing. That, that it's not, the end does not have to be you become the devil's next meal. So let me give you three tools, and we'll go through this fast, the escape route out of this. Here it is. Let me talk to you about that providing the way of escape. So here's the first one. Number one, because I, this, is, this is so key. Number one, the word of God. Here it is, folks. Listen. Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, comes face to face with Satan in what is called the three temptations. And folks, I believe Jesus was setting a precedent for us. He was saying, I'm about to fight Lucifer, not some devil from, from hell or a demon, but I'm fighting Lucifer himself, Satan himself. And Jesus shows us plainly how victory comes. Now listen. If you are, if you're finding yourself constantly hearing the knock and unbolting the door, I want you to understand this. There is, you, you can get all the counseling you want. Folks, you can show up to church all you want. 
You can get people laying hands on you, not just anointing with your oil. They can pour Crisco on you until you are doused with oil. But I'm telling you, if you don't have this part of your life, you can't win that knock. You'll answer the door. Folks, you cannot divorce. Okay, here it is. Get, get this down. Let me, let me really make you mad. A wordless Christian is a powerless Christian. If you don't have, if you think that you just eating on Sunday is enough to, to keep the door locked when Satan keeps coming and, and with the tailor-made, demonically engineered invites, and if you think we have them, it's impossible. Folks, let me say it to you this way. If Jesus needed the word of God to defeat the devil, what makes you think you can win without it? Okay, let me help you. You are not an exception. You're not going to go, oh, no, no, you don't understand. I'm from Puerto Rico. Okay, listen, Puerto Ricans, you'll go down. You're going down. You can't win this without the word being part of your life. Here it comes. Here it is. Three times Jesus said to the devil, it is written. Folks, he went back to the word every single time. It's, it's the, listen, if you come to my office for counseling, here is the first question I always ask. Tell me about your time in the word and in prayer. It's the first question I ask. And here's, here's what I want you to know. It is amazing to me. In 40 years of ministry, I have never had anyone say, you know, I'm reading the Bible an hour a day, praying an hour a day, but I just can't stop looking at porn or I can't stop. I have never heard those words, ever. No one, no one has ever come into my office saying, I've, I've, I've read, I'm in the word, I'm studying the word, and I'm praying. Folks, what is amazing is people that think counseling will fix it. I, 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 we're not against counseling here. We have a counseling ministry here. I'm not against it. But folks, you don't need Pastor Patrick's words. You need God's words. That's what sets you free. So before you go ahead and set up an appointment, here it is. Let, let me help you, Pastor Patrick. Before you go online and set up an appointment with him, set up an appointment with God. How about that? How about that? Start there. And here's what's amazing. Because Jesus, what he does is something that is just amazing. Because he, he says to Satan three times, it is written, it is written, it is written. And Jesus says, let me set the precedent for you. I'll do it out of one book of the Bible. So if you're going to do that, I'm going like, man, I'm, New Testament wasn't written at this time. So I'm going like, go, go Psalms. Go Proverbs. That'll take him out. You know what Jesus does? He says, it is written three times in all three passages. Man shall not live by bread alone. Uh, you shouldn't tempt the Lord God. You know where they all come from? Deuteronomy. I can't even spell it. I had to look at it. I had to go, wait, is it you before E or E before you? And, this, and Jesus goes, Jesus goes, I'm going to choose a book that every one of you are trying to skip through the Bible in a year. That you're, and Jesus goes, no, 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 don't skip that. Because what you think, what you think doesn't matter. If those words come out of my mouth, then those words have power to set you free. You can declare it is written and God I'm telling you will bring the victory every single time okay number two here it is I don't know why I'm yelling number two number two prayer Jesus was in one of the most vulnerable places, second most vulnerable place probably after the wilderness would have been garden of Gethsemane he was fighting the temptation of not drinking the cup of pain that would lead him to the cross the, the agony, the loneliness was so intense. Luke describes it as sweat turning to drops of blood, that blood vessels were bursting because of the agony and the intensity. And Jesus, who felt alone, the men that he brought with him that he thought 
would be praying with him and maybe standing watch with him, fell asleep and Jesus speaks these words in Matthew 26, keep watching and praying. Why? That you may not enter into temptation. Spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. This is so important on how important prayer is. The word keeps the door shut. The word makes me walk in the right road. The word makes me choose the right fork in the road. The great Baptist theologian R.A. Torrey said it like this, the reason why many fall in battle is because they wait until the hour of battle. The reason why others succeed is because they have gained their victory on their knees long before the battle came. They knew that God, listen, but Jesus even adds one other thing to the prayer part. He says, watch and pray. Keep an eye that you're not finding yourself in areas or in relationships. He says, pray, but you better keep an eye on stuff. Because remember, that lion lurks. He lurks. Keep an eye on stuff. I was reading the story of a gentleman that was trying to lose weight. He struggled with his weight. And he said his biggest nemesis was the bakery that was by his house. He said so when he started his new diet, he altered his driving to work to avoid passing by that Italian bakery. He said, then one day, he said he totally forgot, accidentally drove by the bakery. And there in the window was a whole host of Italian pastries. And he said, it was like this temptation came. He said, I, he said, I felt there was no accident. So I prayed, Lord, it's up to you. <laughs> if you. If you want me to have any of these Italian pastries... This is when he prayed. And some of you are laughing because you've done this. <laughs> I pray that you create a parking place for me directly in front of the bakery. And then he said, and sure enough, on the eighth time around the block, <laughs> there it was. Watch and pray. Watch out for bakeries. Watch out. It's not just pray, but it's, it's not just simply praying and putting yourself in a vulnerable position. That if you're sitting, here's a great thing. Let me, let me speak to you single people for a second. Watch yourself when you're praying. Even in church, so easy to look at, looking, thinking like this is like some singles thing. Like you can, you're looking for for, for, listen, I, I want you to meet somebody here, but don't, but when it's time to worship, worship. Some of you looking like, you go, as people are lifting their hands, you're going like, I hope they raise their left hand. I hope they raise their left hand. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Don't pretend you don't even know what I'm talking about. And so there you are, you're going like, no, 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 I don't know if they're married. I don't know if they're married. I don't know if they're married. And all of a sudden, when the hand goes up, you're going, oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. ah. Here's a thought. Watch and pray. Don't watch for rings on fingers. Look to God himself and say, I'm not looking that way. That's what God is asking you to do. Listen, when, 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 when I got married to Cindy, she brought into our, our marriage, she brought in this dog. Oh, Lord. Very obedient. Very obedient. And I asked her about it. She said, well, I took him to, to uh, school um, to learn stuff. I forgot what you call it, like dog school. Obedience school, that's it. I didn't need, you can tell how much I care about. <laughs> we got one now. Um, and it was so, and this dog was obedient. Like, like, it was amazing. Like, she would do stuff like this. And this is what got me. She would, she would put food on the ground, and then she would just go, stay, stay, stay. And this is what she said these dogs learned. They said, when they're in that position, they don't look at the food. They're taught to learn to look at its master. They said, because if it looks there, it's eating that bad boy in a second. 
said, but when that dog is there and she's going, stay, that dog knows I listen to that voice. The problem with some of us is we're looking at everything else around us. What prayer does, it makes me look right at him and keeps my eyes focused on God. All right, we have to finish. Last thing, this is the one I, I struggled with whether to give to you and then I thought, I don't care. So here we go. Mark, come on, let's, let's play, play point three music. Here we go. Prayer. The word, and this is the one that I said, I have to do this one. I'm going to jump at it fast, and it's this, submission. James chapter 4. Let, let me explain it to you like this. I was reading the story of a young man that, who has had a call in his life to go on the mission field. And if you don't know what that means to be a missionary, it's someone who's living in a country, maybe Japan, or living in, in, in Colombia, or living in the United States and feels that he's called to go to another country and, sh and share the gospel. That's what a missionary is. So a missionary takes the gospel and, 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 it's, and goes preaches it in another foreign land that may, that in a section that hasn't heard the gospel. But this young man, the problem was that he still had an edge on him. He still had an independent spirit, had a haughty spirit, prideful spirit. And it came out of him when he spoke to others, when he spoke to leaders, there was just an edge on him. When he went to his leader to ask him about his call to be a missionary, the older gentleman said this. He said, before you can be a missionary, you need to be a submissionary. You need to learn how to submit. He said, you want, you want the job, but you don't have the right attitude. You want to be missionary, but we don't even have submissionary inside of you. I grew up in the church and just the denomination I grew up, binding Satan was a big deal. And we did it all the time. We bound Satan over everything. And it was just something you would say. It was called spiritual warfare. I bind you, Satan. I bind you, Satan. I bind you, Satan. And it was supposed to be, those words were supposed to be the words that brought victory. But when you read the book of James, it's a bit different. James teaches us that binding is not simply done with the mouth, but it's done with the life. It's done with a submissive life. Listen to it. James 4, 7. Don't miss this. Get this. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. And he will, some of us have the word flee, or he will run away from you. See, if you just go resist the devil, and, he, and I've heard people say that. Resist the devil, and he will flee. That's not what it says. The hard part of this, see, I grew up with resist the devil. I bind you, Satan. That's what I grew up with. No one ever said to me, submit to God. That's the submissionary part. That's the part that takes it simply from the words of your mouth and says it has to do with your life. Submission is hard work, but a powerful one. Submission is the fighting word to the devil and so easily missed by the Christian. Submission starts with recognizing God's authority. It's when you recognize God as the authority in your life and you're saying not only is God more powerful than me, but God is wiser than me. So when I read something in here, I yield to it or I submit to it. Submission, let me say it again. Submission says you're smarter than me. You're wiser than me. So when the Bible, here it comes. I don't know why I'm picking on single people, but let me just finish, the, finish it with you today. This, so you're going like, we don't want to go back to that church. Let me help you. But really, you will, you'll be back. So here it is. So when the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked, what that means is this. There's a difference, I don't even have this in my notes, so those are production that's trying to follow, you're not even going to see. There's a difference between ministry and fellowship. You minister to everybody, but the Bible says light can't have fellowship with darkness. It says, but he loves me. Okay, let me help you. He loves you by his definition. Not by this, 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not selfish. This, this, is, this is, 
So we submit to this. So when the Bible says, young lady, when the Bible says, don't, don't get entangled, don't commit your life to someone who is not a Christian, you, what, you, here's what submission does. You're wiser than me, God. You know, because the knocks are always going to come on the door to try to say, you're not going to be lonely anymore. You're not going to have to be lonely anymore. Remember what we said with temptation? With temptation is, when we look at it, it's not just what it offers. I got a man. I got a husband. I'm going to finally be a mom. And you're, all you're talking about was what it offers. But you never talk about what it's going to take from you. And what, what God, what God, when God lays something out, God goes, I'm not going to give you all the details. I'm just going to go, don't be unequally yoked. And I'm not going to go because of A, B, C, D, and E. He says, I need you to trust me that I'm the all-wise God, that I know what I'm doing here. I know what's happening here. It's impossible to resist the devil in any area if there's not submission to God in every area. Don't miss this. Let me say that again. It's impossible to resist the devil in any area if there's not submission to God in every area. That's why the greatest binding you can do is by saying yes always to God. Submission to God is the believer's way of binding Satan from their lives. It's the word of God. You can't win without the word. Watching and praying is essential. And our voices are hollow without submission. You know what's interesting? And here's where we actually do close, Mark. We actually close here. So the call to duty was this. No temptation overtaking you, which is not common to me. God will always provide a way of escape. But it's interesting. Before that verse comes, it was as if the Apostle Paul slaps us in the face. He says, let me, let me just remind you here. Listen to 1 Corinthians 10, 12. He says this, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. It's a slap in the face to say, if you, this is the thinking man, thinking man is in verse 12. The dependent man is in verse 13. The thinking... When he says, no temptation is overtaking you, but as such is common, but God is faithful. You either trust your betraying thoughts of personal strength or your trust in the faithful God that begins to provide the way of escape. Let me explain it to you this way. Stand with me. This, is, this makes you think, at least, no, I'm closing. Here it is. I look down here tonight, and I, this, this morning, and I see... Pastor J.C. Mejia, who we ordained, World Challenge ordained him on Thursday night here. And I remember a conversation Pastor J.C. and I had when I was going to where his church is. I flew into LAX and we were driving to, to his place, which was outside of Los Angeles. And I remember seeing something I've never seen before. Born and raised in New York, never seen this, ever, in Los Angeles. So we're coming out of side of Los Angeles. And as we're going through these curvy parts of the highway, all this stuff, there was this exit, and this is what it said, runaway ramp. <laughs> what kind of exit is runaway ramp? And I said, pastor, I said, what, what's a runaway ramp? And then he taught me. He said, that's for trucks. Runaway ramp, see, uh, uh, how many of you New Yorkers, how many of you know what a runaway ramp is? Yeah, one, you, that's it, okay. <laughs> I didn't know what it was. It's a sand mound that goes up almost 50 yards, and it's sand. It goes up on this giant incline, and this is what he told me. He says, on these giant trucks, they have air brakes, and if you keep hitting the brakes on these hairpin turns all the time, sometimes you hit the brakes so much, you lose your brakes, and they have no way to stop. And he said, what those runaway ramps do is that when a truck has no ability to stop, there is an exit. They can run it up a runaway ramp. The wheels sink in the ground and they get to avoid what literally could have been disastrous. 
it's like you ran out of breaks. Look at me, folks. Look at me, balcony. Annex, overflow. Listen to me. You know what happens in temptation when you keep yielding? You have no more breaks. And you're going, oh God, what do I do here? It's the same thing. It's the same thing over and over again. Can I give you good news today? There's a runaway ramp today. There's a runaway ramp that's going to help you stop today. And here's what God's going to do. This is it. Runaway ramp. We're going to begin, if you're here today and just say, Pastor, man, I need a, the, the temptations. When I walk out here at my university, at my job, in my apartment, in my country, in, in my occupation, in, in my family, they just keep knocking. It knows my price. It keeps going. It keeps going. And it's hard. I feel like I've lost the brakes. My mouth is saying something. My mind is lost, lost the brakes on, on this and lost the brakes here. My heart, the fantasies that keep coming of a broken marriage. And all you do is fantasize what it would be like to be a single man again. You fantasize. Thinking, what is it like when I don't have to be married to them anymore and be responsible? I am speaking to someone in this place right now. And you've lost the breaks. Because you knew when those divorce thoughts came, you used to put a stop to those things. But now you've lost the breaks on this. I am telling you, listen, listen. This is your runaway ramp today to stop a divorce that you think, if I can get out of here, it's hard. She doesn't respect me. And I'm speaking to a man in this place today. I'm telling you right now, walk out of this building, you'll file for divorce. Hit the runaway ramp, God will rescue you today. God will rescue you today. And you stand there and know what's happening. And you know that God is speaking to you right now. And this is a day of liberty. It's a day of freedom today. The breaks have been lost, but I'm telling you, this is going to be a day that God is going to get the glory. Victory is going to come back to your lives today. Victory is going to come back to your lives today. But it takes honesty. It takes transparency. It takes vulnerability to go, I've lost breaks, but I'm taking the runaway ramp today. I'm not going off this cliff. I'm not going this way. I'm not finding myself. I realize the losses, but I'm going to today, 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 I'm realizing no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. I'm going to trust God on this. God, I'm going back to the word. I'm going back to prayer. I submit to your wisdom. You're much smarter than I am. This is okay. I, I've said enough. Balcony, main floor. If you're going, Pastor Tim, I need the runaway ramp. Get out of your seat right now. Just come down quickly. Get out of your seat, wherever you're at. Just get out of your seat. Don't, don't wait any longer. Whoever you are, just go, I just need, I'm losing some breaks on this and I need victory today. I'll, I'll wait for you because I believe balcony, begin to make your way down. This is going to be a day of victory today. This this is going to be a day of victory in this house. God is going to set you free today. He's going to set you free. Don't keep driving out of this place. Let God, let this be the runaway ramp today. And just say, God, I need victory today. I need victory today. Let this be a day. Balcony will wait for you. You're going like, oh, it's such a long walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get, get out, get out, get out of the seats. Get down here. God's going to do it. God's going to do it. I'm in the middle of the aisle. I know, I know. It's so difficult. You got to move by 10 people. Listen. Listen, there is victory in this house today. God's going to set you free today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's going to be a day of victory. It's going to be a day of victory. I'm going to believe for God just to do something. God is going to do something. We're going to wait for just a moment here. I just want to believe for the Lord. You have a song in your heart as they're coming. Let's just sing something and then I want to pray. I want to pray. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand And everything around me sinks I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful through generations so why would he Hallelujah. fail now? He would.
walked. Yes, Lord. He walked. I still got joy. Say, I still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going. Hallelujah. Thank you, Ricardo. You couldn't have picked a better song. He won't fail. Thank you. This is, this is a runaway ramp for you. This is a runaway ramp. This is what this is. Church, just stretch out your hand to these at this, at this altar right now. Father, this is their runaway ramp. Thank you, God. They've realized the brakes are off. They've realized, Lord God, that they, they're, they're, they, they, there's, a, there's no stopping. But Lord, today... Thank you that you are faithful, oh God. You are faithful to them. That's, that's what we've heard. God is faithful who provide a way of escape. So now I'm asking God, would you begin to let the word of God just begin to increase in their lives? Before they begin to look at any spot, before they turn on ESPN or CNN or before they turn on Fox News, before they watch a rerun of, of some show, I pray right now they would say, I give the word priority in my life. I pray be, you begin to start a prayer life inside of them, even if it's 10 minutes a day, that they just get up in the morning and say, God, I ask you today, I put on my armor and I pray, God, that you're going to help me today. And God, I pray that you're going to raise up people of prayer, people of the word, and Father, submissive people that are going to say, God, you are smarter than me. If it says it in your word, God, by faith, I don't even need an explanation. You've already proven yourself to be smarter than I am. So God, I pray the blessing of the Lord right now upon them. Give them a way of escape. They have taken a runaway ramp. Let the air come back in, and I pray a miracle in their lives. I pray a miracle. I pray even today. I believe. Folks, those at this altar, look at me for a second. Look at me for a moment. Let me tell you, let me promise you what's about to happen. Soon as you walk outside these doors, this is what you're going to hear. The knock is going to come. It can come in a text. It can come in a phone call. It can come in an email. It may be, listen, you're, you're, your demon may be waiting for you outside. Because they wouldn't come to church with you. And, here, and here's what I want you to understand. Get this now. The knocks are going to come, but you don't have to unbolt the door. You keep that door locked. And here's what you can do. You can go, Jesus, this is your house. You answer the door. <laughs> you go to this door. Because I... I can't. I don't want to look out that peephole. I don't want to get any tempt. You answer the door. Christ in me is a firm foundation. You answer the door on this one because I can't go there. How, how, listen, how do you beat temptation if you don't know Jesus? How, how, do, you, how do you fight? What, what do you use to fight? I'm a disciplined man. I've got a job. I've got... You can't win in life without God. You can't. And that's why I just want to tell you this. Balcony, main floor, those online, if you're here today, you can't make it without Jesus. You need to relate. Church, this church can't help. This church can't do it. There's not a religion. You could say, well, I'm Muslim. Or you could say I'm Jewish. You could say I'm Catholic or I'm Protestant or I'm a Baptist. It doesn't matter. You can put any label you want. It has to be Christ in you. Greater is he that is in you 
than he that is in the world, which means not you in church, it's Christ in you. And if you have never had a relationship with God, you've been in church, you've sat in a chair, you've sat in a service like this, you clapped, you sang, but if Christ isn't in you, then you don't have a, you don't have a shot. He's got to be in you. And that can happen today. That relationship is called being born again. Jesus said, no man can see the kingdom of heaven now and forever unless they're born again. How does that happen, Pastor Tim? It's, folks, listen, just as you had a first birth physically, you need a second birth spiritually. And that can happen to you right now. You can begin. How do I do that, Pastor Tim? It's A, admitting that I'm a sinner. I can't do this without God. B, believing that God sent his son to die on the cross for my sin. He was my sin bearer. There's not a promise, a priest, a program, a prescription that can set me free. Only the son of God can. And it's C, confessing him as Lord, Romans 10, 9 and 10, and saying every single day, you are Lord, you're the boss, you're in charge of my life. And if you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, I've never made that decision. It's the most important decision you can ever make in your life. And if you're here today, balcony, main floor, online, annex, and you go, I want to be born again today. I want to start a relationship with God today. Without any hesitation, if that's you, hold up your hand. Just hold it up high, wherever you're at. Hold it up, hold it up. I want to make sure I see every hand that's up. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. Keep them up. Gotcha in the back. Gotcha. Over there, 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 there. Balcony, keep them up. I want to make sure I see the hands. Gotcha, right over there, there, there. All the way in the back over there. Annex, keep them up. Online, just type in, I'm deciding, deciding, decided, decided. Come on, let's all pray this together out loud. Everybody, say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Come on, say it now. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. The Bible is my God. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Hallelujah.